Luke chapter 1. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So it seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the first, to write an orderly sequence, most honourable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. This is the word of the Lord. As we come now to unpack those four unusual verses, let's pray and ask for God's wisdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active and pray that today it will continue to do your work in our hearts, that it may equip us for your service and prepare us for the good works that you have prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. So a question that gets asked a lot in history circles is, who is the real Jesus? Is he a political revolutionary, a wise teacher, just a cool dude? These are some of the great photos you can find when you Google Jesus. But who is he really? And how do we know who he is? Can we even be sure that he even existed? More and more, as all the things we thought were certain seem to fall around around us, we start questioning, do we really know what we know? Fake news is destroying our trust in the media. Social media is destroying our trust in the internet. All the things we thought were certain don't seem so sure anymore. So why does Luke say with such confidence that Theophilus can have certainty about the things that he has been taught, not just about Jesus, but about life, God, and his place in the world? Well, if there's anything that God wants us to know in his word is that we can be certain of his word. We can be certain of what he tells us. And the opening to Luke's biography of Jesus' life gives us all the reasons we need to be certain. So let's dive in and see what gives Luke such certainty, why he's happy to proclaim that certainty to Theophilus, and why he thinks we should join with Theophilus in praising God for the certainty that he's given us. You see, the first reason that Luke raises is that we can be certain of Jesus Because there are eyewitnesses. It really is as simple as that. The amazing thing about the Bible is nothing that happens in the Bible happens behind closed doors or in secret. God works openly and in public, and there are always eyewitnesses to the events who you can go and ask to see if God really did act like that. We've been reading through Matthew over the past few years, And as we've done so, have you noticed there's a lot of names in Matthew? Even just a few weeks ago, as we're reading the Easter story, we heard that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there at the cross and were there later at the tomb. Matthew wants you to know that these two Marys were there. They were eyewitnesses. And if you lived in the first century, you could have gone and asked the Marys, hey, what happened at Easter? Did you really see that? But more than that, it's not just Jesus' close friends. It's not just the main characters in the story who get names. Throughout the gospel, all the minor characters get names too. You see, Matthew 26, Jesus goes and has dinner at some guy's house. And we get told that that guy is Simon the leper. Matthew wants you to say, oh, not just any Simon, that Simon. I can go and ask him if Jesus had dinner with him. Mark's gospel tells us that one of the blind people who Jesus healed was called Bartimaeus. So you can go find Bartimaeus and say, did Jesus really heal you? The gospels aren't interested in hiding what happened. They're interested in proclaiming what God has done in real history for real people. 
The Bible's not afraid of you asking questions. If you lived in the first century, you could go up to all these eyewitnesses and say, hey, did Matthew get your story right? Did Luke write it down properly? Did John make that bit up? And they want you to ask those questions. The more you ask those questions, the more you see that God is faithful and true to his word. And the more trust you can have in what he's given us. And that naturally leads us to ask, well, that's all well and good for the people in the first century who would go and check the sources. What about this black Bible in our pews? Can we trust this one? Was it copied properly? Did someone mix it up in the middle? And the amazing thing is that God has preserved his word for us so well that there is no question that we know exactly what Luke said. We may have missed some of the details, but for the most part, what Luke wrote down, we have. And we know this because there are so many copies of Luke's gospel that we can even figure out when one of the people copying it made a spelling mistake. And this is not something we can say about most things in history. Now, as a history student, I've never had to use the little green icon on my computer that's called Excel, but I decided to have a look at it this week, and I made a graph. It's very exciting. It's got two colours. So the blue is the number of manuscript copies we have of a particular work, and the orange bar is how many years between the first copy that we have and when the events actually took place. So we've got some pretty important works there from history. We've got Tacitus, who wrote the history of the Roman Empire about the, about the time that Jesus lived. We have Homer's Iliad, which is where we get the story of the Trojan War for, from. We've even got one of Plato's work. But this bar, right on the left-hand side, that is the New Testament. You can see we've got thousands more copies of the New Testament than anything else we have in history. And if you can't see the yellow bar at the top, that's because it was written so close to the life of Jesus, there's almost no time gap in between. Unlike something like the Iliad, Homer's work talking about the Trojan War, we've got maybe a hundred copies of that. And there was hundreds of years between when the Trojan War happened and when Homer wrote it down. Gets even worse for something like Tacitus, where we've got less than 10 copies and 200 years between the events that happened and when he wrote them down. We know that the Bibles we have in front of us are exactly how God wanted them to be. We know that what God wanted Luke to write down, he wrote down faithfully, and then God's people faithfully copied it down so that we could have it in our Bibles today. What an amazing fact that God has given us such a reliable source for what he has done for us in his son Jesus. God has made sure that everything he wanted in his word has survived, been faithfully copied, and given to us so we can know who he is and what he's done. Which helps us answer our first question. Who is the real Jesus? Well, he's the Jesus that we find in the Bible. The Bible hasn't twisted his words. The Bible hasn't made him up. The Bible hasn't lied. The Bible has faithfully preserved exactly who Jesus is and what God wants us to know about him. In fact, if I even wanted to check the Bible and make sure they got these things right, I could go to a bunch of non-Christian sources and I could tell you that Jesus' mum was called Mary, that he did miraculous signs, that he was crucified on a Roman cross, under the governorship of Pilate in the reign of Tiberius, and then later that his followers claimed that he came back to life. And I can know all that about Jesus before I even open a Bible. If the gospel writers got all that stuff right, why would they lie about everything else? 
The gospel writers aren't interested in making up stories. They're interested in showing us who Jesus really is so that we can know for certain that when Jesus says, I will pay for your sins, I will come back and take you to live with me, we can know that that is true beyond any doubt. But if this is the case, if the Bible has been copied so accurately, why have we got so many different translations? Why do we have so many different English Bibles? Well, that's because translation is more of an art than a science. The easiest way to think about it, I think, is with the word ball. What if I told you that I am going to a ball? What would you think? Am I walking to a cricket ball or going to a dance? Now, what if you then had to translate that to someone who didn't speak English? What word do you use? Do you tell them exactly what I said, that I was going to a ball and risk the confusion of them thinking that I walked over to a cricket ball in the field? Or do you tell them that I went to a dance? And this is the question that the Bible translators have, have to come up with and deal with every time they translate. Some Bibles decide to tell us exactly the right word, exactly the word that the Bible uses. They'll say ball. Some of them want to say, to avoid confusion, will say dance. But in the end, the meaning behind those words is exactly the same. I went to a ball and I went to a dance means the same thing. So yes, lots of our English Bibles use different words for things, but in the end, the meaning behind those words and what God wants you to know from those words doesn't change, even if the individual words do. Humanly speaking, we have every reason possible to trust that the Bibles we have in front of us give us a true picture of who Jesus is, and what he has done for us. But God, in his great mercy, has given us even more than that. And we heard that in our reading from 2 Peter. Well, we heard that as well, but also Luke gives us a rather strange way of talking about it in chapter 1. He says, Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Fulfilled is a really weird way of talking about the history, right? Think about it. We had the show a few weeks ago. What if I came up to you and said, did you see what was fulfilled at the rodeo last week? That doesn't make any sense. Nobody talks like that. Why is Luke saying that something has been fulfilled? Well, it's because he wants you to know that the story of Jesus is only a small part of a much, much bigger story. From the Old Testament, God has had a plan. God longs to live with his people, to walk with them in the cool of the afternoon. But our rebellion against him means that that can't happen. And so he started his plan to enable his people to live with him once more. He called Noah and his family, saved them from the devastation of the flood on the ark called Abraham out of his land and promised that he would be a blessing to the whole world, found a people in slavery in Egypt, rescued them, called them to be his people, gave them his law so that he could live with them. He promised to send a king in the line of David who would rule his people forever, sent prophet after prophet, to call his people back to himself with the promise that one day the problem of sin and our rebellion against God would be finally dealt with. And Luke here is saying all those promises that you see in the Old Testament, here is their fulfillment. This is the high point of God's plan. This is where we see all his promises find their yes, this one man. 
God has given his stamp of approval on what Luke is writing because it's not just a one-off event. It's a part of a much bigger plan where God longs to bring his people to live with him so that he can be their God and they can be his people. And you likely heard in our two, two Peter reading that none of this was made up by people. In fact, we know that this is God's plan because God himself told us it was his plan. He spoke through his people to make sure that everyone knew exactly what his plan was. God's not interested in hiding behind secret codes. He's interested in proclaiming openly what his plan is so that everyone can hear it, everyone can understand. And Luke now says, here is the fulfillment of that plan. Get ready. The final act is coming. If you've got a job to do and you need to delegate it to someone, who do you choose to delegate it to? Do you give it to the person who's constantly forgetting what they asked you to do, constantly nodding off and getting distracted? Or do you assign the job to the person who's been reliable in the past, who's done good work for you before? You give it to the person with a good track record. And the amazing thing about the word of God is that God's track record is perfect. So when he says, this is my son, Listen to him. He will save you from your sins. We can be fully certain that that's exactly who Jesus is. When God says, this is the way that you can be my people and live with me, we can be certain. When God says, your sins have been dealt with, not because of anything you have done, but because of what Jesus has done for you, we can know that that is 100% true. And then he gives us a final promise, a promise that he will return, that Jesus will reclaim his kingdom, and we will live forever with him in the new creation where there is no longer any death or sin. And even times when it feels like that is a long way off, when it feels like that will never happen, God says, look at my past history. I have been faithful to all my promises in the past. I will be faithful to this promise for you, to bring you to live with me forever in the new creation. Who is the real Jesus? He's exactly who the Bible says he is. The Bible's not trying to hide Jesus. He's not trying to make him a puzzle that we have to unlock, an enigma that we have to solve, but puts his life plainly in view so that we can see who he is and what he has done for us. He's the high point of God's plan to bring his people to live with him the plan that has been going since Adam and Eve first rebelled against God, finds its fulfillment here in the New Testament, in the story of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. This is why Luke is happy to proclaim to Theophilus, you can know for certain the things you have been taught. This is why this is our memory verse because we can know for certain the things that we have been taught, because God has given them to us. He has given us every human reason we need to trust his word. But even without all those human reasons, he's still given us enough because he's given us his stamp of approval. He said, this is my word. Whether you have all those human reasons or not, you can trust me. His track record is perfect. This is an odd sermon. I'm not going to ask you to go away and necessarily do anything. But I do need you to know you can be certain of everything that you read in the Bible. 
God has made sure that his word has made it all the way to today just the way he wants it to. He has made sure we have enough to know who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and we have enough to be certain that God will be faithful to all his promises, even the ones that say your sins have been dealt with. The punishment for your rebellion has been paid. You can live with him forever. So if you're someone who's searching for God, wants to know who God is and what he's like, look no further than the Bible. The more you read it, the more you see who God is, what he's done for us, and how you can know him better. If you're doubting, feel free to ask questions. The more questions you ask, the more God gives you answers and the more he says, see, you have a myriad of reasons to trust me. And if you're wondering who Jesus is, look no further than what the gospel writers have given us. They have preserved a perfect account of what Jesus has done. They proclaim clearly that what he has done for us means we can be right with God. We are no longer his enemies, but his beloved sons and daughters. And praise God that he has given us his word. Be encouraged that it has been faithfully preserved for us throughout history. And be confident in the things you have been taught. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it has been so faithfully preserved for us by you. And we pray that you will help us to grow in our trust of what you have given us so that we may praise you with the certainty that Luke gave Theophilus. Amen.